Ask you for permission. Yeah, so there you go. Well, it says recording from my end. Yep, I yep. see recording. All right, we're good. Okay, let's let's get it. All right, so um, if, if you could just get us started, talk about the property, uh, how you guys came across the the, the great opportunity, <laughs> the Valiat opportunity, and I'll let you guys take it from there. So should I go first, or do you want? Yeah, to yeah. Or I'll talk go. about your. If you could talk a little bit about yourselves first, please, and kind of. Well, I feel like you always that. already gave them a quite a bit of intro. I feel like okay. I want to hear more about the, the, the real stuff now, right? <laughs> Let's do it. Yeah, I think we're good on right. intros. So okay, yeah, so I, I suggest If you guys have Omar questions, starts. feel free to ask questions whenever, um, it, as they come up. Yeah, yeah, please do that. So can you hear me? Yes. Yep, so thank you, Anna. How we came across the property was basically with regards to Atlanta, we had picked out certain, at least we'd selected certain submarkets for ourselves. Because like all cities, you know, there, there, are, there are higher income areas, less income areas, higher crime areas, less crime areas. And where, where we are going at least was towards more of the B and A minus sort of properties and areas. So we had picked a couple of spots, Fayetteville, where this property is located, happened to be one of those submarkets. Now, um, in the earlier appearance I made at uh, Jesse and Jose's uh, podcast, uh, sorry, this meetup, there's actually a comment that I made there, which I said, look, when you're going to any place, and by the way, you guys are in San Antonio, so this applies equally, that you can't say when you're talking to a broker, I'm looking for a multifamily deal. Well, what does that mean? Where do you want to look for it? How big is it? What are the characteristics around it, right? So when you try to nail that little piece down, and I think Jose and Jesse can share the video of that meetup, once you have that little investment buy box down, right, then it makes conversations really easy. So because we had that down and we'd, we'd chosen certain specific submarkets, certain characteristics of properties we were looking at. So when this particular property came on board, it was like a checklist, right? Check, 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 check. That's why we decided to go for it. And oftentimes what happens is when you're choosing certain submarkets or certain types of properties, you've eventually done some level of research into that sub market and probably you've actually even gone through that property inadvertently, either as comps or you're looking at something and this is the rent comp for that or some version of that. So that's how it checked off a few boxes. And then we decided to go forward, toured the property multiple times and you know went, went through all of the stuff that we can discuss later. But that's basically how we picked the sub market for the city first, sub market after, type of property after, and then whether we walk. I do feel that it's it's worth noting that um, this wasn't our third or fourth or fifth um, project that we looked at. Um, yeah. That it this project. Uh, so so Omar and I. What, maybe one thing that wasn't mentioned before is that we are already partners on uh, another property with Neil. So so Grow Capitus and Boardwalk Wealth are partnered on a project in Jacksonville, Florida, and that deal closed in uh, February, I believe. Yeah, Omar. Yeah, February. And uh, so we had such a great experience. We're having such a great experience on that. We were like, hey, Omar, let's do this again. So Omar has been in deep um, acquisition mode in multiple markets since, since that time. Yeah. And uh, not only has he underwritten like uh, hundreds of, of uh, properties, but we've are also bid strategically in three markets. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, Fort Worth. Uh, well, Dallas Fort Worth, more yeah, like Dallas Fort Worth. Really Fort Worth. Yeah, right. it was Fort Worth, and then um, what was the other one? It wasn't Atlanta. Oh, Jacksonville. Jacksonville, right? Yeah, Jacksonville. and we were we were like in best and final, and and we we like lost them by a hair. I mean, yeah. it's it was crazy out there. There was a lot of work that went into um, all of those. So this is months and months of searching in three markets, right, Omar? Yeah, yeah. No, and I, I, I really feel like you can't lose that detail that this isn't just like. These, they don't just magically drop from the sky. Um, it's a lot of work and uh, you get very far and, and then you lose it. And that's what happened to two of the deals, right? Oh that, yeah. yeah, no, 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 you're right. Sorry, so I didn't mention that. Look, that, what I, I should have mentioned that. Well guys, that's gonna go without saying. Like yeah. there's a lot of hard yards, like any other business in the world, like any profession in the world. If you have to get to a certain level of success, 
you've got to put the hard yards in. There's just no other way around it, right? So, and Anna can speak to this as well. The thing was, look, we were going, we're going, we're always in the market. Jesse knows this as well, right? So we're in the market, but what happens a lot of times is, unlike baseball, right, where if you get a strike or if you get a ball and you swing at it and it's a strike and three strikes are out, in this game, you can keep waiting for the pitch forever. And as long as you don't, you know, literally as long as you don't swing, there's no strike, right? So, you know, we kept going at it. We kept looking at it and we had, but we stuck to our guns because we had yeah. a certain criteria and that's how we got it over a period of time. Yes. So, uh, so that's how we got the deal. What was your next question, Jesse? Yeah. The, uh, go into talking about a little bit about the property, maybe some of the specs about the property, uh, the size, that type of thing. So do you think we should talk about the size of the property or do you think we should just show them the promo video? What do you think would be? Go good? ahead. You guys, you, you drive. Okay. So Anna, how about we do show you them? Wanna the go, do, do they want to see some of the demographics of, of like the micro neighborhood demographics at all? Okay. Sure. sure. So how about this? How about we show them the promo? Then we show them the micro okay. demographics. Because I think the promo isn't really that long. Right. No. Uh, yeah. And you're talking about the property, the property promo versus my favorite Atlanta video. Yeah, 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 yeah. Let's actually let's show them the drone footage, right? Okay, let's go. Because if the one you were talking about, I really like that as well. But we're gonna Same. save that for when these people. When, give when us it's time to get up and dance. Yeah, and when yeah. these people give us their money, then we'll show them <laughs> that video. <laughs> so you can see my screen, right? Yes, we can. Yes. Here you go. So let me know if you if you can't hear the sound, then let me know. I can hear it. that kind of gives you a rough idea about the type of property. And now we can actually, Anna, why don't you share, if you don't mind share your screen, we can go through some demographics and all okay. of that. Okay. George is like the greenest place in the world. Trees everywhere. Oh yeah, especially when you're coming from uh, Texas. It, you know, you just can't <laughs> stop reading about how, how many trees there are. Yeah. Um, Omar Sorry. and Anna, a quick question um, on the drone video. Uh, it showed, for example, the uh, the park and the, the playground area as renovated. Just to clarify, that was already renovated when you acquired the property, or was that no, something? Correct. The, the, the part of that is renovated, and part of that is broker's marketing, right? Because the broker has to market and say, oh, you can take it to the next level. So it was partially upgraded. <laughs> okay. You know. Um, so... You know, as you know, being uh, that we are multifamily um, university, we all always are looking at population and job growth. So when we're putting together and looking at markets, and then also, you know, when you guys find a, a market, we're, you know, this is in our slideshow, this is how we're showing people. Um, this is Atlanta's employment. Lots of different colored pies. We love that. That's uh, Jacksonville is like this too, but I think Atlanta is even more diverse. So that's definitely something we look for in a market, lots of different in, um, industries. Um, and then here you can see the uh, population growth in Atlanta. So uh, city of Atlanta, which of course is, but we're in the, in the metropolitan area, we're in the suburbs. So we also wanted to show the um, stellar growth in um, the overall metro of Atlanta. So very important things for us to look at. And of course we had lots of demographics about 
lots of um, accolades about Atlanta, about why Atlanta is such a great city. So there's all that type of information. And then these are some of the uh, micro neighborhood by the numbers. I believe a, a good number of these are from Neighborhood Scout, if any of you use that. So uh, in this micro neighborhood, so this is like a one mile or actually less than one mile area, um, there's 3.41% growth in jobs in the last year for Fayetteville. That's a stunning number. Um, score of 86 for diversity. So this is an extremely diverse area. And that's something we, we look for in apartment buildings because then you're gonna have more potential tenant pool. If your um, diversity, if, if your potential diversity is a, a low score, that would mean that you have mostly of one kind of people you know, that live there. And I'm not talking about any particular type of person, but as an apartment building, you want lots of different types of people. So anyone looking at your building can look at it and say, oh, I can see myself living there. So you're increasing your pool. So 86% is a, is a really good number. And then here's that median household income number, which I'm sure you guys talked about last week. Can anyone out there tell me what is the magic number for Neil Bawa for the median household income? Does anyone remember? Anybody? There's a key number. It's, it's a, there's a sweet spot area, but any, it, has to, it needs to be something or above for us to consider it for uh, guess? a micro neighborhood. 40, you're right. 40, 40 is no, right. That's right. 40, 40 is 000. right. So, so this was a very impressive 49.9. And um, the area that's just beyond this area is 71K. So, hey, so, sorry, sorry to interrupt. That's yeah. basically what she's saying is 71,000 is a zip code, but 49 yeah. is like right this neighborhood. Right. right. And um, so, super, so that's a super impressive um, number. And then here's something that we don't, uh, we never see for apartment buildings. This area, again, this is as of Neighborhood Scout because it rates all of the schools. This area had a 10 out of 10 compared for school district compared to Georgia or a nine out of 10 when compared to the US. So this is also a really important um, demographic um, to look for, uh, very unusual. I have a story to talk about on that school district. Uh -huh. um, oh yeah. When yeah. I was <laughs> When I was down there doing the due diligence for this property, um, I decided to kind of do some market research and started going into the other properties and talking to the property managers. And I went to the the Meridian. nearest Meridian. new construction. Huh? Meridian. It was called the Meridian. Yeah, the Meridian. It's the newest property near Weatherly Walk. And we got to talking to the property manager and we found out that the property manager lives or she works at a 2018 vintage property, but actually lives at this property and the, the 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 main driver for that was the school the schools uh right close to the property is the zone the the line for the, yeah. the different school districts or the different schools and uh weatherly walk was on the on the 10 for 10 rating schools yeah so this is very unusual it's not common to find this when you're looking for apartment buildings we've purchased this is our 11th um acquisition in the last 15 months and none of them can touch this. 10 out of, this is just unheard of. Um, property value increase of 11% between 2016 and 2017. So that's a, the household, the single family houses are just a screaming in value in this area. Also a, a super good trend that we look for. And then the submarket is expected to experience rent growth of 17%. Ding, 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 right? We're looking for rents. So this is another very key metric that re really excited us about this micro uh, neighborhood. So uh, now I think I'll go back to um, Omar and uh, maybe I'll put this up. Here's, you yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, let's this. put yeah, this yeah. up. Yeah, we should show this, yeah. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. I'm gonna let you speak, Omar. Oh, okay, thank you. So uh, some, look, some of the big ticket items here were, like Jesse mentioned as well, I'm gonna, we can talk about the renovations first, but I wanna talk about the rents first. And as Jesse mentioned, this, and as Anna mentioned as well, this is a relatively affluent market for basically, a, for, it's a relatively affluent market when you compare it to apartment markets, right? But the thing here was that what had happened is, this, this, these were long-term owners, they've taken fantastic care of the property, they put a lot of money into it, but they put a lot of money into it just to maintain at that level. And because this is such a good neighborhood, it's such a fantastic school district, 
what was happening was that other people like, had come in, for instance, and basically upgraded their property, and then they were charging a way higher rent. So one of the things you could, for, in, for instance, see is Addison on Cobblestone, the extreme left bar. This is literally across the street from Weatherly Walk. It's pretty much the same vintage, and they're charging over $100 on average. Renew at Peachtree, which is about five, six, maybe 10 miles away, but it's in the same roughly area. That's charging even more. So the point that I was trying to make over here is because so many stats were in this favor, we already knew that we weren't going to be pioneers. We were going to copy, for the lack of a better word, a proven business model. And that actually gave us a lot more confidence. So if you actually go back now to the other stats, Anna, if you don't mind, please. Mm -hmm. Right. So now knowing that, knowing how much rent upside or potential rent upside we have, look, guys, there's two ways of looking at it. One way of looking at it is, wow, I can make so much more money. Another way of looking at it is, wow, I can afford to screw up and still make a lot of money. Yeah. Right. I mean, because you've got to realize no plan is ever going to be 100% perfect. So you've got to build in a lot of slack into your system. And when you have so much rent upside, that just goes to tell you that, well, you can afford screwing up and you'll still make money. Okay. Occupancy is 92.3. The submarket occupancy, which is all these other properties, they're, they're more like 94, 95%. So mm. there was some stat over there as well. I know remember. there was some stat. I'm looking for it somewhere. Maybe it's in our um, investment like maybe, summary. Yeah, maybe we speak it or something like that, right? Yeah. Yeah. So it was way higher. It was, it yeah. was like 95%. So this is very low occupancy for this um, micro neighborhood. Yeah. yeah. And then the other deal was, now I'm going to talk about the previous upgrade. So you see this $3 million in the past four years. What had basically happened is that the long-term owners were really good owners, actually. They held on to this property for over 25 years. And this $3 million that they had really invested, this was basically to take care of all the deferred maintenance stuff. So when you go in, or rather when we go in, there's none of this, you know, leaky toilets and the, and the sewers don't work and these things don't work and that, you know, because those are things, for instance, if you go in and fix the sewer, you're not going to get extra rent because it is assumed that your sewers work. Yeah. If you go fix in wiring, it doesn't lead to a value add because people kind of assume that the wiring works, right? So you want the previous owner to have taken care of all of that. So then you, you and I can come in and actually put in more of the cosmetic stuff, the sexy, glamorous stuff, and then charge more rates. So in right? other words, what they were calling upgrades was actually deferred maintenance, things that were wrong yeah. and were bad. That yeah. They were fixing yeah. But, bad again, maintenance. yeah, but you have to realize the broker is never going to call it that, right? The broker is going to call it an upgrade because they have to go out and market this property. So if you don't know these things, you, once you know these things, you understand when a broker says X, he means Y. When he says Y, he means Z. Um, and yeah, and Omar and, and Anna, if you could, um, do you have an idea or, or a reason why if the uh, vacancy in the area was higher, why they, why were they? You mean the vacancy was lower? lower. I mean the, lower, lower. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Great school district. Uh, frankly, there's not a lot of supply. Look, some of this stuff is, uh, to be very frank with you, some of this stuff is post desegregation because if you look at the history of Atlanta and some of the towns in the South, what's actually happened is that as desegregation happened, a lot of folks, to be honest with you, they moved from the city to the suburbs. Now, when certain uh, ethnic minorities move to the suburbs, those folks have to now move out. There's nothing controversial about it. I mean, this is data. This is a fact, right? So you have cities, for instance, like Fayetteville. You have Peachtree City, which have actually created ordinances, say, it's in the mid-80s, mid-90s, which says that multifamily buildings will not be allowed to be built. Or you might build like one building every five years. Now, what that does is if you've got a really good school district, everybody wants to go to a school district. doesn't matter where you're from, what you do. Right. When you've got limited supply I, and you have a lot of demand, what basically happens is that the units that you do have start filling up pretty quickly. So that's one of the reasons. But but was the question why the occupancy is lower here as opposed to yes. the other ones? So yes. that's yes. Oh, sorry. So the, the, the reason for that is straight up that the owner has owned this property for 25 years. They have capped out all of their depreciation benefits. They have literally refinanced this property two or three times and made a boatload of money on it. They had no incentive to throw more people on this property, spend more resources out of their property management firm just to get the occupancy up by a couple of percentage points because yeah. that would not it result in, it's, it's going to be meaningless to their end results. For them, 
for them, for them, it, didn't make money. For them it is. For them. But, but to yeah. us, it's a value add because we know that this, this occupancy is low for the area. And we have our efficiency center team to help us besides the property manager. We're not going to just leave it to the property manager. We're bringing in our, our team, our virtual army to help us fill up the property and then keep the property filled up. So this is our uh, Filipino team that, that does all of these um, various things for us. So, the, the, so we're not gonna fall into the same trap of this. I mean, not that we would, but, but, but we have extra um, processes and systems and um, manpower in place to make sure that we can take advantage of what this market is capable of delivering. Excellent. And guys, if you, if you get to uh, look for more information about uh, Grow Capitals and Neil and, and Anna uh, and their strategies on the marketing side. Um, it's amazing how they take advantage of every single opportunity to attract tenants and how to reel them in uh, from just the first touch all the way up to showing units. Uh, yep. Just the way they do it, it's amazing. And it's, they don't leave any, any rug on turn. <laughs> um, here is uh, amenities. You guys kind of saw the, the walkthrough of it. Um, Omar, you want to talk about the business plan? Yeah, we can talk about the business plan. So the business plan for us, as I mentioned, was basically a lot of this, I'll be honest with you, is sexy, glamorous stuff, right? So for instance, when we get to say an interior unit, we're going to put in faux granite and in some cases, granite countertops that just oozes sex appeal, relatively speaking, right? We come in, we have two-tone paints, we take away all these dingy white looking tiles that are just kind of gross. We put nice stuff in. And basically the idea here on the interior is to strategically renovate the interiors up to 70% 70, 70 of the units. We're, we're spending between 700, it's a 700 over there, between 700 and $900,000. The renovation should roughly take between 18 to 20 months. On the common areas, a lot of this is you saw the lush foliage, right? So taking yeah. advantage of that, doing a, a lot of landscaping, but leaving a lot of things untouched because it does really look nice. We're gonna put an Amazon locker. Now that's a win-win for everyone. The reason why it's a win-win is the property manager has got to do less work. So now they're able to focus more on the actual management of the property. It's a win-win for the tenant because they don't have to wait for the leasing office to be open. They can go yeah. in and say 2 a.m. at night, right? Punch in their code, they got their package. When we're also gonna, the new monument basically means because we're rebranding the property. It was earlier known as Weatherly Walk. We're now calling it Equinox at night. You know, it's, it's a more hip kind of brand. So that's a new monument. And the rebrand and improve operations, which is the, the fuchsia color over here, you, you can see efficiency center is what we were just talking about. That is the Grow, the grow Capitalist Efficiency Center, where we're basically complementing the marketing uh, and increasing the leasing velocity at these properties. Alexander Properties is our property management team. And the exit strategy really, like a lot of value add strategies, is potential to refinance in two to four years with disposition in three to five. So let's talk a little bit, since we're mm -hmm. talking about exits, um, let's talk a little bit about the financial highlights, especially the, the loans. So do you want me to go about it or do you want to go about it? Yes, man. I love hearing you talk about sure. that. Before we get there, uh, Omar and Anna, let me, is everyone okay to this point? Anybody has any question? Please. And please ask so questions. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please actually ask questions. Don't wait. Yeah, this is a end. completely open forum, guys. So yeah. feel free to ask. All right, go ahead. Cool. So we, do you want to go back? Yeah. Yeah. So let me just tell you where I was thinking of going with us, um, Omar yeah. and, and Jesse and, and all. Um, so I was thinking we'd give kind of the highlights of, of the financials uh, and then just a, an intro to what the projected returns in percentages uh -huh. and money and then go into then go the that, spreadsheet. Yeah. Right. Sure, yeah, we can so we're that. kind of easing into Excel. Sure. Here okay. we go. So look, uh, the project returns are 1.9x equity multiple. What that basically means is that for every dollar you give us over the course of the holding period, right, which we projected is up to five years, we'll give you a dollar ninety back. So this, uh, so one dollars and ninety cents back. Essentially, what this means is that if you include all the cash on cash returns plus the returns that you'll make on exit, which is upon sale, 1.9x is a multiple. So for every one dollar you give us, you get a dollar and ninety cents back. Which includes your original dollar. Which includes your original dollar, obviously, mm -hmm. right? Skin in the game, basically, guys, is very important because essentially, for the lack of a better term, you don't want to be involved with people 
who don't invest any of their own money. Because the issue there becomes that it's a case of heads I win, tails you lose. Heads I win in the sense that if this property performs well, you think I'm a genius, I definitely think I'm a genius, and everybody is really happy. But you've got to realize what happens if the property doesn't perform. So the sponsor has got to feel some level of pain, right? So they don't just check out of the properties and performing. So we put in $300,000 from our own pockets just to show you, you know, our, our interests are aligned with the investors. Uh, on the loans aspect of things, we've got a bridge loan. There's a couple of reasons for that. But the biggest reason from, from my side, at least, is that A, if we're going to dispose of this property or at least refinance or finish the value add process within two years time, getting an agency loan is completely asinine. I mean, and the reason why it's asinine is- Can you that, say that here? Can you, can, <laughs> sorry, what? Asinine, right? It's not a bad word. It's more, okay. than one, it's more than one syllable. Yeah, as long as you don't cut the word in half. Okay, yeah. all right. Yeah, I mean- if, yeah, as long as generally you don't got the word in that. Look, it's as, and I'm going to say asinine again. It's asinine because you, we're going to do all this hard work, right? So we increase the NOI, we've done all these renovations. But if you've got a, if you've got an agency loan, and then you want to go say in two or three years time to either sell it or refinance it, you get charged massive prepayment penalties. Right? So just an agency loan in this case, for some of you that may not be as familiar with the term, we're talking about Freddie, Freddie Mac, Fannie Mae type debt that um, tends to be a 10 year. It can be a seven year, but the average is 10 year. It can be as long as a 12 year. And by, by um, locking in those long terms, they will give you those, um, you know, always lower interest rates. And in today's terms, the interest rates are just astounding that um, are being offered by Fannie and Freddie. However, that's like a, like a black widow laying their trap. Because if you're trying to do value add, as Omar is describing, it, it, it does not work for you. So just had to throw that in there to yeah, but look, expand on agency. Yeah, but look, the flip side to this is, if you're, for instance, buying a property by yourself, as in you and your family are buying the property, so you know there is no external pressures, you want to hold on to this property for, I don't know, pass on to your kids and something, then by all means, go ahead and get an agency loan because you know you're going to be in this for the long haul. But contrary to what pretty much any sponsor or any multifamily sponsor will tell you, we all make our money upon sale. Essentially, we make like 80 to 90% of our money upon sale. So it isn't. So what's actually going to happen on the ground is that a sponsor is going to do all this hard work and then they want to sell and get the money. So if they, if they force you to get into a, say, an agency debt, the problem is going to be all the prepayment penalty or the penalty that the, the lender charges you, that's not coming out of the sponsor's pocket. That's coming out of your pocket as a sponsor. Yeah, that comes out of the profit. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. you will be affected. The sponsor will not be affected. So, so just some things to keep in mind. The loan, by the way, over here, the interest rate, which it says 4.8%, we were really conservative on it. Yeah. Actually, the interest rate we ended up getting was 4.51%, actually. Yikes. So, wow. We, I mean, I mean, to be honest with you guys, that's like somebody giving you free money. That, that's ridiculous. Right. Um, and the general thought, I mean, a lot of people said uh, for bridge loans, they say, well, bridge loans are risky because it's not fixed for such a long time. So what if the interest rates go up? But the general- what if the, what if the market turns too? So can you- So, yeah, well, that so what happens? So, let, so what happens on, when the market turns? Yeah. yeah. So what happens when the market turns? So what happens if we, if we do go into recession? What happens to interest rates? Do they go up or do they go down? Take a wild guess, guys. Because I literally- Down, like, everyone's saying down. They go down. So what right. is our risk yeah. in the next three to four year time frame of interest rates going up? Very low. Relatively speaking, right? It's a probability yeah. game. Nobody knows- It's a probability game. game. We're exactly. So if many people are saying, hey, there's a recession coming, there's a recession coming. Well, that doesn't mean, why would we want to lock in the agency debt at current interest rates then and try and, uh, you know, sometimes you lock into agency debt, you say, well, somebody will assume it. I'm going to sell it to somebody else. They'll just assume my loan. No one's going to want to assume a loan that's, you know, half a point higher than what they can get. Well, oh, actually, so, this is happening right now. I'm looking yeah. at a few deals in Atlanta. Yeah. And one of some of the problems are that there are guys who want to sell their assets. They want uh, whoever's buying to assume the debt. And that debt is at 4.8%. Now, look, I'm going to be honest with you. 4.8% in any other time in mankind's history 
on these types of assets would be considered a steal. Yeah, absolutely. Like, I mean, I was like, dude, like, help me out here. I literally got a loan like two weeks ago and that's 30 basis points lower than this. And I don't even have to go through all this paperwork of assuming and doing this and that. So just keep that in mind because a lot of times people are concerned and say, well, I'm concerned about a recession and interest rates going up. I was like, dude, you can only have one or the other. Yeah, it's not going to happen. Because if though. it's a recession, the Fed isn't going to dig a deeper hole. And look, if it's a boom time, you're not going to have a problem selling the property. Okay? It's not, that's, that's not going to be your problem. Yeah. So just giving you some context around, you know, when people, a lot of times people hear things and we repeat things without necessarily realizing that they don't necessarily make sense. And when you step back and actually think about it, then you actually realize, oh, a lot of things that people assume are, are common sense are neither common and they're nonsensical. Now, there's also another thing out there which, which people talk about with a recession, which is not just interest rates, but they talk about um, what happens if the, if the cap rates start going up. So that is definitely something that happened in the last, um, in the last recession. However, Interestingly enough, we are, we are seeing interest rates going down for the past, uh, what, a year or so, and cap rates have continued to go down with it. So we no longer have this situation where interest rates are going down and, and you know, the, the relationship is it's changing. So as, as, um, if we have a recession, there's no longer this tight coupling between cap rates and uh, the market because... There's so much money out there in other countries that can't get nearly the amount of interest rate that they can get. They have negative interest rates going on in their countries. So there's money pouring into the United States. And where are they going to put it? Many of those people are looking at multifamily. And because of that, that's keeping our cap rates low. So that is the other element that can happen in a recession is cap rates can start to go up. But many people think that cap rates are going to stay, you know, maybe they go up a little bit many people think they're going to continue to go down. And just to let you know, guys, you don't want to be in a really high cap rate market also, because that probably means you're going to get stabbed and have one of your kidneys stolen when you go visit the property. <laughs> so, you know, keep that in mind also. You don't, the higher cap rates doesn't necessarily mean a better quality product or no. oh. a better deal or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. You know, so, and the total equity raise was about $7 million. And by the way, we raised that in about two, two and a half days or three days, whatever it was. So that just goes to show you, A, the quality of the product, the quality of the team, and then the quality of the offering. Anna, so, do you want to take this? Uh, sure. So so uh, we'll show you the, the underwriting um, next, but just to give you um, an eyeball full of what the projected returns are. These are cash on cash returns. So uh, there's an eight pref for this. So the investors are getting an 8% preferred return. So they've got 8% year one, year two, year three, it starts to go up where they've got 9.3%. And then notice it goes down here. So that's a bit funny, right? What's happening here? Well, what's happened is this is year three and um, our bridge loan, should we keep it past here? The interest rates have changed. So we are, we've gone through three years of the bridge loan and then this is the extension, correct, Omar? Yeah, and this is actually where we, the interest only period goes away. Yes, right? so, so the interest only, so it's both. So the interest only period goes away and we're going into an extension of a one-year loan and then an extension of a one-year loan. So that's why we have this, this switch. But you can see it's, I mean, all in all, that's not an extremely dramatic ch change. I mean, it's almost a point, but it's less than I'm used to seeing actually the difference between um, when IO stops. Yeah, and guys, by the way, this is just on that point about the bridge and uh, how quickly all syndicators, including ourselves, want to get out. You got to realize our business plan, you see how the, by business plan, I mean the renovation plan was between 18 months to say maybe two years at most, right? So after this, around say the 16, 18 month mark, if you're actually executing on your business plan, most syndicators have their hair on fire either trying to refinance the property or to sell it because they've done the bulk of the heavy lifting, right. right? So when they sell it to somebody, the idea is that that person is looking more for a turnkey solution, a stabilized property. Whereas we, for instance, have to spend hours and hours and hours every week making sure that we don't leave, we don't leave any rock unturned, 
right? So it's a different type of buyer type of that buying a different type of property. But that's why you see, because we're trying to get out in two or three years, this gives us a lot of ample room. This gives us a lot of runway in case we're not able to execute on a business plan. We still got three years right. to go through something. And, and can, can you explain the extensions, plan, the one, the two extra years? Can you explain that yes, a little bit? Um, Omar can take that one in just a sec because he was, uh, uh, but, but I wanted to say when we're talking about the business plan and getting out early, we're not just talking about cutting off our nose here. By executing the business plan, we're talking about reaching our end goal that we had promised, you know, projected to um, investors much earlier than anticipated. So that is when we're like, we've already, we've already met our business plan. So now it's time to exit. So we're not just stopping here and saying, let's get out early. So I wanted to clarify that for people that it is about reaching the projected business plan, hopefully in an earlier time frame than um, we speculated to investors. Yeah, and look, the, at the end of the day, what you also want is comfort to know that in case things don't work out, because sometimes things don't or can't or won't, you just have enough time, right? Because you've got to realize a lot of times when you are, or anybody is put under undue pressure, people tend to take stupid decisions, right? When, you're, when your back is against the wall and you just got to do something. So you never want to put yourself in that situation. You always want to be well capitalized. You always want to have enough time. So you're able to take decisions calmly, coolly, without any pressures. That's also a big reason. <clears throat> so Omar, here's the, the loan yeah. information again, just to talk yeah. about the three years plus one year plus one year. So basically guys, over here, what basically happens is that because it's a three plus one plus one, the plus one plus one, what it really means is that we have to hit certain uh, objectives or certain say key metrics that uh, the debt, the lender actually asks us to get. So for instance, on this, I think we have to hit a 7% debt yield in the, when we're trying to do the first extension, which is years three to four, and an 8% debt yield from years four to five. That basically means that our performance has to follow certain paths, which is really going upward trending, because otherwise the lender is not gonna basically give us the extension on the loan. Yep, so we've That's gotta perform. Yep. Yeah, so it's a pay for play sort of deal, right? You, you perform, you play. If you don't perform, you're cut out of the game. And yep. you actually want that. You want sponsors to feel that heat because mm -hmm. if they don't feel the heat, look, as an example, if they don't have skin in the game, they don't feel the heat, if things work, it's all good. But if it doesn't work, they're just going to check out and then your money's gone. Yep. So here's that same slide that had the, uh, the percentages um, as, as if you had $100,000 invested. This is always a very um, good um, example for some people that they, they just read it better this way. They like seeing dollar signs. So we always like to pr show dollar signs. And in this case, this um, end of, uh, one, of course, does not include the original 100000 invested. So remember, Omar was talking about if you give us a dollar, we give you back 1.9. Well, here's that 0.9 that is your profit. That is that, that 1.9x equity multiple. This is what it looks like in, in dollar dollars. Um, and then we're just about to go to the 1031, sorry, the, the Excel spreadsheet. But I will say that we, um, we, this property was an example of a 1031 eligible project where we had our normal um, investor entity, which in this case was a, a, a limited partnership, an LP. Um, and then we also added on a tenant in common structure to bring in some 1031 investors. And this is a, a vehicle that, that we are um, doing for different various properties where, where it makes sense. It has no impact. Very quickly, could you very quickly explain uh, 1031 for the new people uh, that are not familiar with the term? Sure. So a, a 1031 is um, the ability to defer your taxable gains or your, your taxable, uh, what you'd be taxed on for your capital gains by taking a property that is a, an investment. It has to be an investment property, not your primary household. And instead of selling it and paying taxes on it, you sell it uh, and then you put that money into a, a holdership, a 1031 exchange company and replace it with another property. You can never touch the money. It has to go into this, this um, account by the 1031 exchange people and then go into the replacement property. If you do it all right, and it's got very specific timelines associated with it, then you um, do not have to pay any capital gains on the transaction. So 
So the money goes from one property to the, to the other without paying taxes. Now, it is a tax deferral. It's not tax-free. So it can if be were... tax-free if you die. <laughs> if you die. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's tax-free to your heirs. Yeah. <laughs> um, but as, let's, let's assume if this person doesn't die. Um, if that person were to sell the second property and not do a 1031, then they would owe all the taxes from the first property and the second property gain. So if you're doing a 1031, you want to do, uh, that's the strategy in my family is that we, we, we're like 1031. Um, we love it. We, I've already done seven 1031s, all of my siblings as well. So um, if your strategy is to do 1031s, you ideally want to hold on to it through your entire life and pass it, those um, assets onto your heirs, your children, whoever your heirs are. Because when that happens upon your death, there is a step up in basis where that property is now stepped up into the, the current value and there's um, there's no taxes owed by your heirs on that on property. all the on the previous games on all the previous uh, all the previous games. it all goes away so yeah, they but their can clock then, starts yeah but their clock starts yeah so their clock starts so then they can sell it at market value right then on that day and take mm -hmm. that that profit and and they're good so all right thank you so much so um omar i'm going to stop sharing and you can uh, throw up Put up your Excel spreadsheet, please. Oh, all right, real quick. Um, the, the models and, and the financials and all that they share are not going to be dispersed. So this is a pro, pro, proprietary. That's a difficult word, I know, Yes. Yeah, proprietary model and the um, T12 and rent rolls are confidential because you know when you go to a broker and you get that information, you always have to sign a confidentiality agreement. And so as, as such did we, it's got tenant data on it. It's got real, it's real data that's in there. It's not fake. Okay, so give me one second. Now those numbers that I was showing on, this, on the slide deck were not the updated numbers um, with the interest rate as it closed. So the projected returns are probably even better, right, Omar? Yeah, I mean, they're different in the sense yeah, they're that- They're different. Yeah, so, so certain you things they, keep changing, so- yeah. yeah, and that's one thing that while he's pulling that up, that is one thing to, to know about underwriting that, you know, we do, we do kind of draw a line in the sand and say, this is the final underwriting we're using for, you know, to show to investors and it's the best we can get. But it, it does continue to change. Interest rates change. You know, this changes, that changes. So it is an iterative process. The you know the to, uh, underwriting is so. Yeah. So you guys can see that stream. Everybody can see that. Yes. Yeah. Cool. So how do you want to start this? Like, what do you specifically do? You guys want to talk about? Maybe we can structure it whatever way you want to structure it. Well. Uh, basically. Um, no, I mean, you. I think you pretty much show the the, the returns and and yeah. how look. I don't know if uh, everyone anyone would have any specific question about the underwriting itself or. Uh, how about if we look course? at the um, expenses, Omar? Because um, that's you know we haven't talked about that yet. Like on the pro forma, looking at you know looking at the T twelve and then working with the property management to come up with our model. So do you want to talk about our projections or do you want to look at the T12? Okay, we can look at the T12. Well, just the T, oh. how the T12 translates. Yeah, if, into if you don't mind, um, we can tie it with uh, one of the questions that we have is, uh -huh. you know, what are, are there any challenges that you, what are challenges that you found with this property? Maybe something that you found on the, on the T12 or things that are uh, opportunities to work with or challenges. Okay, so one of the challenges was, well, it's not really a challenge. It's, it, it's an opportunity and a challenge. It depends how you look at it. So the challenge slash opportunity was the payroll, the payroll number oh, yeah. or it was something that we really had to work on and work with. The other thing, I think a lot of folks, which for whatever reason, they didn't realize or they didn't really take into account is that the property management percentage, if you think, if you look at it this way, so let me just show you. So I'll take the property management number divided by the total revenues. And I just want to illustrate a point, so I'll show you something, right? So if you look at it, you'll see that it's 6%. Can you see my screen? Yes. It's huge. Right? So it's 6%. Now you would think, okay, 
wow, that's really weird. What's going on? Are these owners stupid or what's going on? And that's not really the case. The case is that the existing owners, which I've told you have held on to this property for a long time, they also happen to have a property management firm. So this is so the reason why they can charge more money to their property is because they have a property management firm and they happen to own the money as well. Oh, sorry, they own the property as well. So they can, it, it's a lot of accounting stuff. I don't want to bore you to death, but basically this is a way to move money from one entity to the other. So that's why you see such a high number, but we obviously don't have it at 6%. 6%. We have it way lower. So just to give you an idea, that was an opportunity right off the bat that we saw that we could come in and cut property management fees pretty much by half or 45%. And that was, that was gonna be a big saving, right? So that, that's one opportunity slash uh, risk. I mean, the risk is that you might try it and find out, oh my God, this property really needs a lot of work, right? So we did a lot of due diligence and figured out it wasn't necessarily a property issue. It's more of the case of uh, an owner just deciding to charge his other company, which he happens to own more money than he should be than in the open market. The other thing over here, which, I, which I'm actually really liking is the fact that we have no rubs. I love the fact that we have no rubs. And now you would think, well, why wouldn't you wanna have rubs? Because rubs, it basically, it means you can, for all the utilities you consume, you can bill back to your tenants a certain percentage or certain dollar value. Now, the reason why this has no rubs or no utility bill backs is because all of the units are individually metered. So all of the tenants, they pay 100% of their own bills. Typically what happens is you try and you try and you try and you try and the most you can get people to give is 75% of their bills, right? Because properties are master meter, right? They have just one meter. So in this particular case, the tenants take care of their own bills, which basically means that extra 20 to 25%, which we had to eat ourselves, we're not eating that. The tenant pays their own bills. That's another big thing, by the way, on the property from an operational perspective as well, because you can imagine that when a new management comes in and they jack up the rubs rate, to basically say, hey, you, you now have to give me more money for the utilities you consume, that really, lack of a better term, it really pisses people off, right? So we never really even had to get into that. The property management was a big thing. The other thing which we realized over here was that uh, a lot of basically the costs that the sponsor had already, the previous owner had already done, they were also in the, in the process of still incurring a lot of costs. All the things they were putting instead of capitalizing them, they were expensing a lot of things. Now, what does that do? What that does is that it artificially lowers your NOI for no reason. It's just an accounting thing. It shouldn't be happening that way, but it was happening that way. So that was something that we really picked up very quickly. Payroll was the other. Uh, yeah, so yeah, what else was there? Well, I just wanted, I feel like you're going a little bit fast for some people. Mm -hmm. So I just want to clarify that the repairs and maintenance by, by putting in capital expenditures, those are things that you can put into your CapEx account, which gets is below the net operating income line. So it doesn't affect your NOI and your NOI does what? Your NOI divided by the cap rate determines the value of your building, right? Mm -hmm. So you're always trying to protect your net operating income and be careful about what's counting against it. Well, in this case, this owner um, had, I, I can't even imagine why they were doing it, um, Omar. Look, it, it had, happens from time to time, especially yeah. if, you've, if you've owned a property, you made your money five times He's over not, he, So, so he was, they weren't that Quite concerned about it. But it, uh, Omar is, is accurate that it, it, it presents an opportunity for us because they were putting things into the right, the wrong bucket. Um, uh, it, yes, it was the repair, but it was a repair that should have been um, put into the CapEx area and thus not impacted the net operating income of the property. Yep. Some of the to other clarify, things. Yeah, go ahead. To clarify, uh, CapEx is capital expenditure. So basically Correct. you can depreciate that uh, right. those expenses versus and it one. lives in a different part of your, um, of your profit and loss statement. So. Yep. And the other, some potential wins that we can implement over a period of time are valet trash across all the units, washer and dryers on more than a hundred units because this prop, this tenant base can afford that extra expenditure, right? And they would like it because look, they're living in a good school district. It's a very family oriented community. In fact, when we were there in the afternoon, because we were doing our due diligence and stuff, there was a stream of kids with backpacks. You know, when the, the bus drops you off at a certain time, there's like back to back, grade two, grade three, grade four, grade five. I mean, kids were just streaming back. So, you, you know, typically what happens is when you've got kids, you've got a lot of dirty clothes. 
you know, and everybody hates lugging their laundry down to like a laundromat. So people will gladly pay 50 bucks or $55 for a washer and dryer. So and the washer, they can dryer, have the washer dryer hookups are already in the unit. Already there. Yeah. yeah, the washer dryer hookups are there. And these units are very nice size for family, by the way. So this, that is one important thing when you're looking at an apartment building. We talked about how good the schools were. Well, if this apartment building was a bunch of studios and small one bedrooms, mm -hmm. it wouldn't be relevant that the school district is so good. But this specific building is, is uh, very um, desirable for families because of the size of the unit and the low, low crime, as well as the school districts. Of course. So again, those are some of the big things. Um, what were some of the challenges, Anna, you felt? Like one was the 1031, right? But that's more of an administrative challenge. It wasn't really a challenge. It was, it was, a, it was a challenge with a lender related yeah. to the 1031. But, um, um, you know, the lender certainly took a while to, to close. So the, the lender was a, a, a challenge, but we got through it. Yeah. Um, uh, I think that the, the whole, you know, I think maybe you should give them a little bit of the story of the, the property management and how you got the deal, whereas other people didn't. So in our particular case, how we got the deal is that we are retaining the existing property management firm. And how that happened is that one of the questions I asked uh, the broker and then one of the owners indirectly at the start at least was, well, what's your big incentive for selling the property? And what are you looking to do next? Because look, you're going to get a nice amount of money. What are you really looking to do next? And the guy straight up told me, he said, look, I mean, I was at, I was young once. I was your age once. I did, I've been doing this stuff for 40 years, but now I'm at a very different stage in my life and acquisitions is a young man's game, right? Because you've got to go out there. You've got to meet people. You've got to power on the pavement. So he's got a property management group that manages over 5,000 properties in five, 5,000 units in five states. And he said he was looking to transition and keep most of the property management because that is a more stable business, right? That's a, hey, you come to the office every day, you do your job and you clock out at a certain time sort of thing, right? Whereas in acquisitions, what happens is someday time, you know, when a deal is live, you get no sleep. And so it's feast or famine, right? Whereas property management is more like steady any sort of a business. So they were looking to transition more over there. More than that, what was also happening was that they were looking to try to work with the group and keep that property management there. We interviewed them, we liked them to begin with, but when we really knew that this little factor was in play and that, that was really the deciding, sort of in a way, an, a mental block or a mental deciding factor, we really played up on that. Yeah. I made it a point to go talk to the owner personally, follow up on personal calls. That doesn't always happen. You know, the owner started telling me, because I, I went to school in Toronto, the owner started telling me, you know, he'd been to Toronto a few, like a few years ago. His son basically loved the medieval times there. I don't know if he's been to medieval times. It's nice if you're really drunk. It's, it's a great place. <laughs> <laughs> Other way, it's kind of dumb. But they really enjoyed it, right? And you start developing that rapport. That, that's what I'm trying to say, right? But you can only really develop that rapport when you really understand what does the other party re is really looking for. Because if you don't know what they're looking for, how can you position yourself to stand out from the crowd? Then you're just like any other person. So yeah. one of the comments they actually said was, look, there were a lot of out-of-state buyers. There were a lot of buyers who were within Atlanta as well, but nobody took the time to really talk to us and kind of get our feel. And there were a few people who were paying a little bit more money as well but we were able to get the deal because we developed a personal relationship. Now, obviously- And we were keeping the property management because none of, yeah. the, other, none of the other people were willing to do that. Yeah. What is the risk for us if the property management doesn't work out? Well, the risk for us if the property management doesn't work out is that we'll have to transition property managers. So for the next one or two or three months, as an example, there's a transition period. But you also have to realize with these companies that are managing five, 10, 15,000 units, this isn't a fly by night operator. No, 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 it's no. not there. They are very experienced, but I'm yeah. just saying for us to give up on that, for us to understand that that was a big deal to them. And for us to say, it's really not that big of a deal. If we keep this, uh, this property management, we're an experienced group that, uh, that knows how to change property managers. We understand how to do that transition. So it didn't scare us. And I think some of the other people were like, no, we're absolutely not going to keep your property management. Absolutely not. Whereas we're like, what the heck? Sure, we'll keep your property management, you know. There's also, by the way, a strategic reason 
the strategic, apart from all of this, you know, apart from things related to the deal. The other reason also is you've got to realize, guys, this is still very much a local game. It's, a, mm -hmm. it's a, because look, a lot of, like as an example, there are folks who are say managing $800 million of assets in Texas, but frankly, nobody's heard of them in Atlanta. Or there's groups in Florida that are managing $2 million of assets and nobody's even heard of them in Georgia, right? Because it's still a very local driven game, still contrary to what you hear. Uh, local relationships matter a lot. So when you're working with people that have been in a market, like say Dallas and Atlanta, Houston, a Miami, Jackson, or Orlando for 40 plus years, they also have a lot of local relationships. So it's not just one deal you're looking at, you're looking at over the runway of your relationship. So deals two, three, four, five, a lot of times they're able to open doors. They might take you to the mayor's office as an example, or the city, or they might be able to pull permits quicker, right? Whereas the other guy's gonna take them forever, right? So you've got to realize those things, those relationships, you're not just getting a property manager, you're getting the sum total years of experience of that property manager's relationship in a local market. And in a lot of these markets, you can't buy that, frankly. You can keep paying more money and you're not gonna get anywhere. So you also have to remember that as a strategic. Relationships are still very important, especially in the South. So you yeah. always have to keep that in mind as well. It's, it's transactional, but not as transactional as you would think it is. I, I would like you to jump into rent comps. I think that's a subject that um, gets left off a lot. And you can just jump in here and show, show uh, and talk about how you got where did you get your rent comps from, Omar? So there's two locations, right? So when, let's assume the first time around, when you basically, um, when the broker sends you the OM, right? I mean, you've got nothing, all you've got is an email and you download the, download the OM. So here you go. So let's run through a quick exercise and we can show you what happens, right? So let's assume I know nothing about that, this property. I just have the broker's OM and I the read through memorandum. the offering memorandum. I read that. But like all cynical people, I'm not going to believe what the guy says, right? So I never will, believe what never, they say. Never, never, right? So I will literally show you the five minute way on how to find a lot of these things. You know what? Secret is going to Google. That's the secret. You don't, need anything. <laughs> you don't need anything else. You literally type Weatherly Walk Apartments, Fayetteville, GA, Georgia, right? Here you go. I type this. Um, do this? We can can't, we're seeing the Excel spreadsheet. Oh, okay. Hold on. Uh, oh man, all that little dramatic pause I took between. I know. Uh, hold on. Now you see, I'm going to say this again. Okay. Okay. So right. you go to Google. So all you type is Weatherly Walk Apartments. You can see my stream now, right? Yes. Fayetteville, Georgia. Right. Now, what does this do? First of all, I confirm it's the right address because you don't want to, you don't want to start doing work for the wrong property. I just open up Google maps. Number one, go here click on Google Maps. Now it basically tells me where it is. But the other thing I also want to do is I want to open up apartments.com. Mm -hmm. And then what I want to do is go over here. So I kind of want to zoom in a little bit. And where the heck is this, right? So what I kind of want to do is zoom in. I think I zoomed in too much. And I want to see what are some other apartment buildings around it? Because I just want to do a quick and dirty five, 10 minute thing. So I see there's Weatherly Walk Apartment Homes right here, Swanbrook right here, and Addison on Cobblestone right here. I did look at Swanbrook. It turns out this is a, a government subsidized housing for senior residents as well. So obviously that's not a comparable, right? So the next one was Addison on Cobblestone. So what do I do? I go to Google again. I type Addison on Cobblestone. And by the way, all of this stuff is free. So, yeah. you know, this isn't some like magic trick that I only know of. Right. So what do I do? I do the same thing. I can open up their website, right? Because that'll give me like the latest rent numbers. But what I can also do is open up apartments.com. Now I can go through all this stuff, but really starting off, what I really want to do is look at the pictures because what I kind of want to get an idea is, well, how do these properties look? So I look at Addison, right? I go through all these pictures one by one. I see, hmm. I mean, it doesn't look too bad. I think it kind of looks nice. I think it looks nice. I, I think it looked very nice, right? Maybe you should make an offer. Yeah. The problem is they already have had a change of ownership one or two years ago. That's why it looks really nice. But what I do now is I go to Weatherly Walk, which is the competitor or the comp, but the one that we're really interested in. And I start comparing the pictures. And what do I see? It looks nice, 
But as you can see, it doesn't look as cool as this property looks. You see how the lighting is nice, the paint yeah. is fresher, the finishes oh, are dated. nicer. Yeah, so as you can see, I mean, there, nothing looks off if you think about it, right? This doesn't look off. It just looks a little outdated, right? Yes. So now that gives me certain things. Now, the other thing I can do is, uh, how do I exit out of this? And again, guys, this is just the five or seven minute analysis, right? Because what you, do, what you don't want to do is chase your tail for two hours and then figure out, oh, this is not making any sense, right? So I kind of get an idea. Okay, the one bedroom is 925. Three bedrooms are 1325. Quick, just quick and dirty right now, right? I go to Addison's website over here. It says floor plans, right? So I'm going to click on it. It says so, call for pricing. Oh, oh no, 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 no. It used to have the pricing over here, actually. I don't know why. They, I think they must have changed it. So I can go to apartments.com. It used to have the pricing over it here. It still said call for pricing on apartments.com, too. Will it? Does it? Oh, call for rent. Gonna, oh, that's not cool because it used to have the pricing over here and all of these prices were like between $150 and $300 higher, right? So you can, but hey, you know what you can do? Save yourself the hassle, literally call for pricing. Yeah. How long do you think is it going to take? And when you call, do you think they're not going to give you the price? They want to give you the price. They want to rent an apartment, right? Yeah. So that's basically the quick five or seven minute quick and dirty. You don't got to do a lot of, for instance, analysis. You don't have to do underwriting. You don't have to kill yourself in the process because if there is no rent upside, as an example, right? What are you going to do? You can't do anything. Right. And, and if the apartments already are fully renovated. Now, yeah. here's, here's the thing. Sometimes you're going to go on to apartments.com and you're going to see the apartment looks really nice. And you're like, oh, it's already renovated. But if you can go back to the broker or go back to the offering memorandum or the broker, maybe there's only 10 units that they've renovated like that. And that's the model that was then photographed for, um, you know, for the apartments.com and for the offering memorandum. But the 90% of the units or, or even more are, are not renovated. They were just proving a point that they could, what, what could happen. So you do always, always want to ask how many units are renovated if you see that it's renovated. And this is, by the way, the property that Jesse visited, the Meridian at Lafayette. This was built in 2016. Now, obviously, you can see it, yeah. it, does, it does look nicer. But one of the things that I want to show you is that it's going to tell you what is, say, I mean, 1200 to 1380, right? This basically means it's more 1380 than $1,200 for rent. But one of the things that I wanted to show you is that it tells you what is the ceiling of rents mm -hmm. for, say, in this market. So, for instance, if Weatherly Walk is whatever it is, $925 right now, right? And the Meridian, geez, where did that go? The Meridian at Lafayette is $1,380. Now, that tells you that 1380 is a theoretical limit, upward ceiling in this market for a one bedroom because that's the newest, nicest property. So then you know that your answer, if you renovate, is somewhere in the middle. And what's the square foot comparison between the two? Oh, this probably is going to be like one is 786 and one is 720. So they're not, they're they're not that far of, apart. Yeah, it's not that far apart. Yeah. But you do want to take notice of the square footage. You don't want to compare things that are too far apart. Yeah, but you also have to realize that they, once you understand what is the limit, what is the ceiling, yeah. and then when you realize where are you, then you understand. Because look, you you're, you're obviously also have to use some common sense, right? You, because you know, you can't price it $50 below the new bill because people will be like, dude, I'll just pay the 50 bucks and move to a new newer bill. But that gives you a relative point of reference. And that's right. all you're really trying to do in the first five or 10 minutes. Because once you start getting deals, what you realize is you're getting, say, 20 deals a week or 30 deals supposedly a week. You can't spend two hours doing everything, man. You're going to go crazy. So this apartments.com, why do you trust their data so much, Omar? Well, it's not necessarily whether I trust their data or not. Number one, the issue is they, everybody else also looks at the same data source. So number one, if we're wrong, we're all wrong and we're all looking at the same reference point, number one. So our relative referencing is the same. But from a not so cynical point of view, apartments.com is owned by CoStar. CoStar is the biggest database company or industry database within the multifamily industry. So you know that on average, again, on average, there you always have to do your due diligence, but on average, they have the freshest data coming through the system. So that's, right. that's another big reason. Yep. And they actually call owners of multifamily on a regular basis to check what the rent is. 
So this isn't just data that they scraped, you know, three years ago. This is tends to be more, the more the current data that you can find out there. Yeah. For free. All you have to do is go there. It's free for you. CoStar costs a gazillion dollars, but apartments.com is free. And guys, this is just step one, okay? We're not yeah. saying don't do all the other steps. This is just for you to get some context at the start, whether there's enough meat on the bone here for you to go even chase this. Once you do decide to chase it, then steps two, three, four, five come into play. But why go there if step one doesn't work? So what about um, uh, things like rent growth and um, expense growth and stuff like that? How, does, yeah, how do you, yep, assumptions. So talk about your assumptions in your underwriting. So as you can see over here, we talked that 17% was the expected um, assumption, uh, so expected rent growth over the next five years. So we are coming in at lower than that, 15 and a half. Now, part of the reason here is that in the first year, the reason why we have higher growth, especially in the first one or two years, is we're doing a lot of heavy lifting in the first one or two years, right? But we all know that the further out our forecasting goes, the more conservative we have to become because right. you know there's just more things that could happen, right? So that's why typically you see pretty much everybody's rent growth is kind of the same thing. It goes up the first one or two years and then goes down. And that, or rather, that's the way it should be, right? Because the further out you go, the less... Uh, points of reference you have. So therefore you should bake in a lot of conservatism into your uh, numbers. And to be honest with you guys, the inflation rate is more than 2%. So if, even if you're just growing at the rate of inflation, two and a half, two percent 2%, that's a reasonable assumption to make. Yeah. So, so should we go got, down to the rest of the stuff? Sure. You've got other assumptions, uh, which is one of the things I love about this, this particular model, um, the, the, Ability to tweak all the different assumptions is not something you find on a lot of models. And uh, I love that, that this is an, uh, a feature. So basically the rest of the assumptions are around loss to lease, which basically what it means is loss to lease means, look, potentially or theoretically, uh, the market rent say might be a thousand dollars, right? As an example, theoretically speaking. But let's assume somebody comes through the door and you want to lease it out. And the most as it's right again, we're just going through an example. You lease it out at $980 as an example for whatever reason, right? So the $20 is the loss to lease because what it basically means is that if you had just waited for the right candidate, you could have potentially gotten more money. But we all know in reality, things don't really work that way because we set some, some level of a pricing like, hey, if I get this price, I'm kind of good with it. And yeah, there might be like five more people in the market who might pay you slightly more, but are you going to wait an extra month to get that $20? Because if you wait an extra month to get that $20, you're also losing the $980 that you were going to get at month one. So what you don't want to do is you don't want to cut your nose off to spite your face. So that's what loss to lease means. The vacancy is basically a number built in over here. The reason why you see it's high 8% and then it slowly goes down to what we said is a submarket average of 95% is because as we are basically renovating units, we're jacking up the rents, we're doing all this work at the property. A lot of tenants for economic and other reasons will choose to move out of the property, right? They might say, look, I don't want to pay the higher rent or I can't afford paying the higher rent. So therefore, at the start of when we're actually doing this work, we just have to assume a higher vacancy rate Again, to be conservative, it might not happen. And then slowly, slowly, slowly over say three years, we come back to the submarket average. To the submarket average, that's right. Right. And those, those vacancies give us our opportunity to do our value add turns. Oh. Um, so that's, you know, we, we want to see some of that vacancy. We've got, to, we've got to renovate those units. And if nobody moves out, then how are we going to execute our business plan? We're not throwing people out on the street we're simply bringing their rent, their rents up to market, or maybe a little even above market if we really want to want them to move um, on their lease renewal. So that then they have the choice to take the lease at the current at the at what we're offering to them and continue with an unrenovated unit at that price, or move someplace else, which opens up the unit for us to then renovate and bring it to that even higher uh, mark. I don't know if you saw when he was showing you the rents, there was an unrenovated column and a renovated column. So there's the market rent, which is called the class, sorry, there's a classic rent, which is your unrenovated, and then you have your renovated. So you're always gonna have some in, in both categories, but we wanna be 
as, as our business plan is to move 70% of the units from classic to renovated um, during our ownership. And the only way that can happen is by turning, I think we're, what, what do we have? Six units per month is our goal Six right now? Six units per month in the first year, but, in we're, the probably first year. Gonna, but we're probably going to push more than that. But that's just to begin with, right? Because right. what happened is you ramp up slowly over a period of time, right? You right. don't suddenly do things you were going to do in month 15, in month one, because right. look, as an example, Lakewood Oaks is a good example, right? We could, for instance, renovate a lot of units, but if our exteriors don't match our interiors, yes. we could renovate a lot of units. Nobody's going to pay us more money because think about it. If you come into a property and it looks okay, it doesn't look the best in the world. Your interior could be as nice as you want it to be, but nobody's going to pay you more money because the That's exterior right. doesn't match the interior. So you got to realize there's lots of stages and processes and things in the, at the start. And so you just have to build a lot of slack into your system, be a lot of conserv conservatism into your underwriting to ensure that, you know, even with mistakes, you're not caught flat for it. Right. But your underwriting is your business plan. So in order, you, you do need to remember that you're, you're there to execute a business plan and you need to look back at your numbers because you're trying to hit the numbers because if you're using other people's money, you were projecting that you're going to, you said, I'm going to do this and here's how I'm going to do it. You can always pivot, you know, things happen, but you still, you can't lose track of that underwriting. So that underwriting is not something you throw away um, after you buy the property and you're like, I'm done with this file. I don't need it anymore. No, no, you need it. You got to keep, keep it. And it also, and just to add to that point, a lot of times it also helps to calibrate you, right? Because yeah. what happens is we, everybody get we get so caught up in the day-to-day -day actions that a lot of times when we need to take a step back and see, okay, well, what did I actually want to do before I got sucked into all of these things? The right? yeah, yeah, in the minutia of things, because that, it does happen. It also provides that context, right? Like, what was my business plan? Where am I going? And if I'm not going in the right direction, how do I pivot back to that place? Right. So right. it gives, and we it gives do, you that perspective. We do like to do that after we've got 12 months of data is take it and go back to the original underwriting and compare it and say, you know, here's where I am, here's where I thought I'd be, and then learn from those trends that we're seeing, say, and you're learning from the specific metrics like bad debt or, you know, concessions and vacancy. What, how did my assumptions compare to the actuals? And what direction does that mean we're going right now? And how do I need to uh, pivot to address that? Mm -hmm. So- the other thing over here that you will see is that bad debt is uh, somewhat lower than, say, the C-class properties. Uh, yeah, much lower. Say. But again, that's a testament to the type of tenants we have, mm -hmm. the type of submarket we're in. Yes. Because, look, you guys have to realize at the end of the day, bad debt is often directly correlated with the amount, uh, with the amount of income or not income people have. So think about it this way. You or I could come in and put in, like, granted countertops and granted everything. But if we're doing it in the hood and nobody can afford paying us, that's just throwing money away. Then you really can't blame the tenants because you, you know, a sponsor came in over engineered the problem. So you have to realize that a lot of these metrics are not metrics that you can just take and apply to any property. Yeah. These are very much very market and micro very market specific. and product driven, you know, metrics. And then, do you know, the property management fees that we were saying, saying it was about 6%. Well, we are at 3.5%. So that just shows you right off the top how much meat on the bone on the property management alone we just had, mm -hmm. right? So that, that gives you some context around the numbers. Uh, Adding to, uh, to what Omar was saying about, yeah, that you, basically knowing what improvements to do depending on the property and the market. Um, yeah, I mean, if you're, like he was saying, putting granite counters on on a lower income area where people have to, decide, do I pay this much for this unit or, you know, do I pay for food on the table? Uh, that's going to be an easy answer for them. Uh, so just, it has to be very, uh, very specific on your plan on, on the, based on the property and the location and the demographics yeah. that you're working with. It has with. to match. There has to be a match. And that so, again, goes back to the median household income, right? Remember that? Yeah. That kind of captures a lot of points right there. So big picture wise, what else should we look at? Do we have any question here regarding? Yep, we got a question from Kelly. Yes, please. If you could talk about a little bit about the taxes. Omar or, and I can just show you the taxes actually. The, prop the property taxes? Yeah, 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 yeah right, yes, I can just show the you property the property taxes. 
I can just show you the property taxes. So what happened in Fayetteville is that, okay, this is somewhat specific okay. to- uh, So the question, yeah. Omar, uh, just to clarify the question that he's asking is uh, on the taxes, because his uh, understanding is that once you perform the improvements on the, ta uh, on the property, then the property is gonna be assessed for a higher value, so your taxes would be affected by it. So how do you approach the taxes? No, my friend, it doesn't really work like that in yeah. every county. Yeah. So I was going to say it's it's very depending on the location. The county, yeah. Depending, the county yes, yeah. depending on the county. So just first of all, just to give you an idea, Fayette County, where this is, is Fayette County assesses the, the tax they're going to charge every three years. Yeah. Uh, some property do it every year. Some counties do it every year. Some co counties do it. On transactional there, yeah, sale. Some, there, you know, sometimes, yeah. yeah, there's a million ways to do it. Like, for instance, as an example, now you would think, well, if you buy a property for X value, then it should really be X value multiplied by the tax rate to give you like say the tax, the dollar in tax and all. Well, that's not the way it works over here and in a lot of counties because what you do is the purchase price multiplied by like a percentage, which is a percentage off the purchase price. In this case, it's 40%. Then you have the millage rate or the tax rate, which is 3.12%. Now, if you were to just look at this tax rate, and you were to compare it to say the taxes, say as an example in Texas, in Dallas, that would be 2.2%. You'd be like, wow, uh, Georgia has way higher property taxes. Well, that's not really the case. Georgia has lower property taxes because the percentage assessment of property purchase price times the appraised to purchase price percentage is way lower. It's 40% here. Whereas well, in Dallas- was it 80 or something like that? It's, yeah, in Dallas, it's yeah. in Tarrant County, it's coming to 95 or even 98 yeah. or even 100% these days. In Harris County, in the Houston, it's right about 100% right now. In Bayer County, in San Antonio, they're increasing it a lot. So you have to realize, it's not just the millage rate, which is a tax rate. It is how much of the purchase price are you assessing that against? So there's lots of moving parts. And then the other moving part in this particular case is that Fayette County assesses their taxes every three years. Mm -hmm. So some counties do it every year. So you understand there's lots of moving parts and that's why a lot of times it pays to actually have a, a local tax, talk to a local tax consultant. They'll give you an idea, they'll provide you a guidance and then you go from there. And look, at the end of the day, to be honest with you, every self-respecting property owner in the US should be protesting their taxes, right? So we protest mm -hmm. our taxes as well across all properties. Now, in some cases, it might not work. In some cases, it does work. In most cases, it does work, right? But what you gotta realize is if you don't protest your taxes, what happens in the future is then next year, the tax assessor, that's where they start from. So every year your base keeps going up, right? Yep. So you gotta realize whether you win or you lose, you've got to protest your taxes. Yeah, uh, guys, and, and you gotta be, um, you know, like like we said on the last, uh, on our last meetup, uh, for you guys that were here, um, it pays a lot if you decide to focus in one specific market or one, two or three cities, whatever you choose, but then you can deep, 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 uh, dive very deep into it and you get to know how they calculate their taxes. You get to know, call the county, find out what the tax assessor, what process do they use to, to calculate taxes, um, property management costs and payroll, all those things you can get to learn what is typical for that particular property or property location. Um, those are the benefits that Omar and Anna have been able to obtain during these years and uh, you know, get to get into a property in this location with such great uh, characteristics and uh, deep dive into it and, and get, it, get it working. So is, are, are there any other questions? I'm sure there are. Yes, Patrick. Okay, so what the question is what why um, the property management cost changed so abruptly from six percent to three and a half, and the reason yeah being the same one, the reason was that this was being uh, correct me here guys if I'm wrong, but it was the same owner's entity it had its own property management company, so basically they were charging themselves a specific Hi, amount. Yeah, a higher, a higher amount yeah. just basically goes to their same pockets, or just a different pocket, but their same. My friend, when, you, when you're a rich guy and you've, when you're rich people and you've got multiple pockets, these are the accounting games you have to play. 
with yourself. Yeah. But in reality, but we weren't going to pay them six percent. I mean, we weren't going to pay them, and rightly so. They never even negotiated on six percent, right? It was understood that this is an accounting trick. That's it. I mean, yeah, they, they, were, they didn't yeah. even fight it. They were like, "Yeah, we know this." So, yeah. if, if this, like, if you, but look, you have to realize if you don't know these things, most people would start at six percent and maybe settle at five, right? Because yeah. you think you got to win. But if you know this and you're like, "Yeah, okay, Andy, I know this was like a." accounting thing, but really here's what the market is being. He's like, yeah, here you go. Yeah, but they did try 6%. Their first thing, the first yeah, I mean, they in was- They're like, gonna try, obviously. You can't blame yeah. them for trying. Come on, like, yeah. no? So you do need to know your exactly. market. Your question. Right. Any other question, guys? This is an exceptionally quiet group for the first time ever. There will be some fight. The projected price. So how confident are you in the projected price? For, for the sales price. Oh, the expected sales price. Um, how confident or how do you get to the estimated sales price? Guys, how we get to the estimated sales price is that we take the NOI in the last year and we divide it by a cap rate and we've artificially inflated the cap rate to more than what we, to we, so for instance, let's put it this way. We think that the market is going to be less bad than what we have projected, or we have projected a way worse market than when we bought the property. So do we know the exact sale price? No, but because we baked a lot of conservatism into our number, so we're estimating on the low end what the sale price is going to be, as opposed to estimating on the high end. Can you throw up your spreadsheet again and show them your, your exit cap rate? Because it is very important uh, for underwriting, exit cap rate is a critical thing. So it's, in, in, it's at the bottom of, well, there it is right there. Okay. So just to show them, you know, what happens if you- 5.6. Uh, yeah, 5.6. And what did we buy it at, Omar? So we bought it at 5%. Basically. 5%. Okay. And so it's a five-year hold. And so we're projecting it's going to be 5.6. Yeah. So, so what happens if we were extremely bullish and foolish and um, we, we thought that it was going to be 5.2 exit cap rate. So, here you go. so there first you go. of all, just remember 33.171 million. Save it, is, save it off to the side. Copy, yeah, yeah. That, copy that off to the side. Oh, hold on. I don't want to see your password. That's not my password. This is, <laughs> I don't know what happened. Oh, geez. Okay. So. Okay. So that's at, that's at 5.6, okay? Now, if he changes this exit cap rate by going lower, so if he says it's gonna be a lower cap rate instead, we bought it at five and we think it's gonna be 5.2 at exit, look at what that does. Yeah. So then we, this. right, which, and then if you if you uh, scoot down and look at your returns, oh, your, are your returns are not being impacted yeah. by that? No, they are, right? The, the IRR goes up 18.6. Oh, your, your the uh, equity multiple is 2.14. Yes, okay, so those yeah. ones went up, the 8.5% the didn't go up. Yeah. So notice that, that, you know, so that is something you have to be very careful about in underwriting. No, the but your average your, cash on cash would not go up. It's just- Yeah, yeah, yeah of course, of course. Yeah. yeah, yeah, your average cash on cash wouldn't go up. But it, you need to be very careful when you're analyzing deals, um, even to invest in for yourself, that they're not doing something funny with the exit cap rate. Yeah, it's a big, big contributor and it hits the number really hard, either up or down. It could make yeah. a big, big or, swing. Or think about it this way. If we just bought it at 5% and sold it at 5%, we would be at 36.984, which is really the difference is $3.8 million. Now, I don't know how rich you guys are, but 3.8 is a lot of money to me. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Any other question, Patrick? Yeah. I heard bridge loan. Do you hear the question? No, uh, I just heard bridge okay. loan. Okay. All right. So with either. the scenario that, that you have with the, with the bridge loan in place um, and having the options or decision point at later on, uh, either refinance into a, a, a 
permanent loan or a, uh, or a, what is was, Oh, okay. Sewing so in, yeah. yeah. So in, in the case of, of uh, what he's saying on the case of refinance, a lot of times uh, the, uh, the 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 uh, the management group takes the LP and pays pays them either partially or or, or completely or pay them off their their investors. You don't no no hold uh, on. You don't pay them off. What <laughs> happens? Is, no no no. That doesn't work like that, man. Unless you're running the world's biggest scam. It doesn't work like that. You don't pay them off. What you pay off is what you return to them is their equity. They still yeah, the, have the a initial, share. In the yeah, correct. Yeah, correct. they still have the yes. same share in the deal where they started off. So it's not like you buy them out That's and correct. they're like sayonara, right? It doesn't work like that. No, correct, correct. Yeah, it's that, yeah they're, they're initial investment. Yeah. Um, correct. But yeah, how, how would that work out with... Uh, is that possible with this strategy with the bridge loan that you're putting? Yeah, out? that's the entire reason why this is happening. Because with an agency loan, you don't, you really don't have a lot of options. Because look, it's nothing wrong about the agency. You've got to realize this. That it's is a different type of product. Plan. Yeah, it's a different business plan. It's a different product, right? It's a bit like if you want to haul, I don't know, a ton of lumber, you don't get a Ferrari just because it's a more expensive car. You still get a truck. But if you want to go really fast, you get a Ferrari. It's that sort of thing. It's different horses for different courses. I think the question may be um, guessing because I couldn't hear it. Um, but did we do a refinance? And, and Omar is um, no, I'm opposed. Adamant. He's adamantly opposed to including refinances in the underwriting because it can falsely boost your returns. Uh, it, it definitely boosts your IRR because you're giving money back earlier to yep. the investors. So your IRR gets jacked up and looks yep. extremely good. Um, so Omar is not in the camp of, of doing that. Will we refinance? Um, yeah, potentially we'll refinance. Then the investors returns would only get better, but that's not a, the game we play in uh, with Omar's underwriting for our projects. And it's not a game for every project. I don't want to say anytime a game, um, a project has a refinance, it's a game. It's not. Um, cause you know, we refinance all the time, especially with new, new construction. When you're building new construction, um, you, you know, you go vertical, you finish building, you have a construction loan that you're building with. Well, you have to, to, to refinance out of that construction loan to go into perm loan because yeah. because a, a construction loan is, uh, is a recourse loan. So you don't want to have that recourse loan. So, so, so again, it's different, different reasons that you might want to um, do. Yeah, but it's a different kind of business plan. It's a very yeah, different right? type of business yeah. plan. Yeah, it's just so, so Omar, for this project, it is not baked in. Sure? Uh, there's no refinance baked in to this project. And, no. and, and it, you will not see it baked in in any value adds for Omar. Yeah, and look, guys, I'm going to be honest with you. I can bake it in. You will think I look like a genius, but yeah. that's just... That's just it's being conservative. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, you, you just pull a number out of your ass. Again, asinine ass. You just pull a number out of your ass. And yeah, you look nice starting out. But my point is, why make a promise you, are, you have no control over? Why make a commitment you have no control over? Yeah. Okay. Right? That's what it boils down to. All right. Any other question? Sure. Anyone? I think we're good. Oh. Do you have a rule of thumb for your exit cap rate or how do you determine more or less the exit cap rate? I don't really, I mean, I think it's market dependent, product dependent, right? If you have a C class property, 1970s bill, you might go like 75 to hundred basis points higher. But again, it also depends what cap rate you're buying in, what the market cap rate is, what the business plan is, what market you're in. Look, if you're on fifth Avenue, New York, that's kind of a different ball game that if you're in, St. Louis, Missouri. Yeah. Right. I mean, so, so you always want it to increase the, the question is how much are you increasing much? per year between, between your entry and your exit? How, how much basis points are you going to go up? And I think that's, you know, that's yeah. what he's addressing is it really depends on the asset uh, class as well as the uh, market that you're in. Again, guys, this boils down to being in the market, looking at deals, seeing what other people are doing. How are, say, other smarter, sophisticated sponsors handling this? Do you agree with their assumption or not, right? Because sometimes people can make an assumption you don't agree with. Well, if you don't agree with that assumption, what are the reasons? If you agree with it, well, you know what the reasons are. So 
this comes from experience. There is no magic formula, right? Where you type it into a calculator and you get an answer. So a lot of this is being in the market, knowing your particular market, knowing your particular sub market, talking with other people who do similar businesses in that market, understanding and learning from them because you're continuously learning, right? There's no like you stop and you know everything and that's it, you're, you're living in a vacuum somewhere. Any other question? Any not related to this property, but any general question that you might have for Anna or Omar? Is the time, guys? It's not usual that we get, <laughs> yeah, picked brain on these people. Yes, quickly. Um, that's a, a, the question is: Is there a minimum amount of money to invest with you guys? Um, Typically, it's seventy-five k yeah. for a project. Do you have to be accredited? Uh, it depends on the project. It depends on the project. Our our project in Jacksonville, which was in February, was um, was non-accredited, um, but this last project was accredited. Um, I would say for Grow Capitus, nine and a half out of ten projects are going to be accredited now, because we uh, love using social media um, to pro to advertise, and you can only advertise if you are doing accredited only. There's a lot of power that we get from having, from the ability to advertise. And if any of you are on our social media, you might notice that we are uh, been teasing you guys about a deal that's coming out uh, next week. So uh, we couldn't do that if it was uh, for, you know, sophisticated or non-accredited 506B. Yeah, and, and guys, both uh, Anna and, and Omar are on Facebook platforms as well, Pro Capitas and uh, Board with Wealth as well, and uh, multifamily you as well. So, um, and they provide also tons of information, podcasts, videos, um, yeah. a lot of knowledge uh, for free. So uh, take advantage of that. Um, and um, can, I, can I mention, since you guys are in sure. San Antonio, that we do have a, a boot camp coming up in Atlanta um, in uh, March, in the first week in March. So if anyone wants to come to our three-day um, amazing boot camp with Neil Bawa teaches and uh, I teach the underwriting that's coming kind of halfway closer to you normally it's in California but it will be in Atlanta and it does include um, bus tour so there's a good chance you can go see this property and see um, the work that we're doing on that property so you'll see the renovations that are in progress nice where can uh, people get information about that and uh, multifamilyu.com um, slash bootcamp and right now there's a uh, or extra early bird special that gets you a thousand dollars off so um, I think that that special is good for about two more weeks uh, and the page itself has lots and lots of information about what the content of the course as well as um, testimonials and videos and lots and lots of information there um, to find out more about it Awesome. And Omar, uh, website, where can people uh, take a look at uh, videos and uh, material that you post? So you can go to our website. It's Board Walk Wealth, B O A R D Walk Wealth, one word. Right on the front page, fill out your name. Hopefully, you know that. Fill out your email address and fill out where you heard about us. Click on the button, it'll send you an email, verify your email address, and then you'll be added to our mailing list. But what you can also do is go to YouTube, type Board Walk Wealth. That's two words right there. And you will go to our uh, YouTube uh, whatever channel. I think it's called a channel, right. right? Click on the subscribe button. It's a little bell. Click on the subscribe button. You'll see all the videos. And especially for the last two projects, we started doing this. For the Lakewood Oaks project in Jacksonville, if you click on the playlist, you'll be able to see the how, you know, when we bought the property where it was. And over the months, it's it all like two or three minute videos. But what you'll be able to see is how has the property progressed from when we bought yeah. it? To how it is right now and we keep updating that because that actually gives you an idea because it's really hard to lie on video right you can't lie on video but that gives you an idea you start off at a certain spot and over the course of the month so you better watch it chronologically over the course of the months you update this thing oh what does that do you update this thing what does that do and that provides a lot of context that actually makes you understand because till you don't see it you don't really it doesn't really click that way till you don't actually see it happening yeah, true value out. I mean, you can really see it happening at Lakewood Oaks. You know, they uh, were 
pretty tired looking, great bones, but um, really they were pretty tired looking buildings. And now they're all, it's all been rebranded. They're all um, painted. The interiors are being turned. The, lots of things have happened in that community to make it a much uh, better place to live. Awesome. Thank you guys. We cannot thank you enough for your time. Uh, appreciate every, every single minute of it and information you provided. Um, any other question? No? Well, thank you guys. You can uh, thank, thank you guys you. for joining us. And you guys be, uh, have a good night. Appreciate okay. it. Thank you so much. Really appreciate right. it. Thanks guys. Thank you. Man. Bye -bye. Have a good Thanks, night. Thanks Omar. Bye. See you tomorrow. Bye.